Hello, my name's John and I'm the inventor of a new light painting tool called a Spyro Jib. What the Spyro Jib is is a light painter's version of the old child's toy uh, Spirograph, where you took a couple of gears and a pencil and spent hours making circular designs on a piece of paper. The jib works basically the same way, except instead of a pencil, we're going to use lights and make imprints on the exposure of a camera. The operation is very, very simple. You connect a light bar to it, you spin the crank, and around the light bar goes. Uh, you can change the gears on this system. You can change the angle of the light. You can change how the light is mounted. And all will give you a different variation of the flowery circular designs. What my intentions are today, though, when we're done, is if I do it right, I'm going to show you step by step how I built this out of an old bicycle, a glider stool, footstool, and a couple of nuts, bolts, and washers. Good luck. Get you a pencil and paper so you can take you some notes, and let's see if we can't teach you how to build your own. Okay. First thing I want to do is kind of give you a parts list that we're going to need off the old bicycle of the glider. We're going to need on the glider, it's one of the little stools that kind of rocks back and forth that don't really swing. Well, it glides on bearings that are inset in the wood. These are very easy to pop out. Um, if you don't have an old glider or don't know somebody's got one they're willing to donate to the cause, you can order these bearings online. Just look up glider bearings and you'll find them. The uh, Bicycle parts we need are the chain, the rear sprocket, I think they call this a cassette, and the part of the frame itself where the pedal cranks are, we're going to cut that out of the frame. That's this piece right here. This was the piece that went up to the seat. You want to leave it pretty long. In fact, until you get it built and figure out how you're going to mount it, I would cut the whole pipe out. You want to leave it connected to the hub because it's pretty well centered on every one of them I've seen. It's centered to the hub and center, being centered is very important. you got two pipes coming out going back to the back wheel. You want to cut them off flush with the side of the hub. And then the one pipe that's coming up to the neck you want to cut it again flush with the hub. Now yes, you're going to be left with these gapping holes, but because we're light painters and chances are we're not going to get our gear out in just torrential terrible bad weather. The holes are not a big issue. Matter of fact, you can cheat instead of having to pull bearings and greasing all the time. You can squirt some oil up in there and, you know, kind of a cheater's way of oiling your bearings. Not a bad deal. Okay, another piece we need to cut is on the crank. Uh, when we took the crank out of the hub originally, the sprocket was mounted up against this side and there was a pin coming off of this bar that stuck through the uh, inside of the sprocket. And it was, they use it so when you torque down on it, you don't spin the sprocket around the, the bolt that's holding it in here. But uh, where that pin is, we're going to be holding up here, and as you spin around, that pin will be able to gouge you if you don't cut it off. So go ahead and cut it off. Use grinder and kind of smooth it up a little bit. Once you've done that, we've made all the cuts that we're going to need to make on the frame and have all the parts laid out that we're going to need. Uh, first assembly we want to do is work with the hub. Now on either side of the hub are these pressed in bearing races. The this little cups that the bearings ride around in. You've already taken them apart when you disassemble the crank. Uh, to get these out, the best way I found to do it is to take a wooden dowel rod, a half inch, one inch, you know, anything that'll fit inside this hole, but you want to do it with wood. You don't want to do it with metal. You don't want to bang metal to metal. Because if you distort these races then the bearings won't ride on as smooth and it'll hang up. So you don't want to take a chance on hurting these. If you'll take a wooden dowel, put the uh, hub in a vise, put this tube here in a vise, take the wooden dowel and just kind of tap around it, it'll fall out. You know, work your way around it slowly. Like I said, don't bang it, don't hammer hard on it. Just let it work itself out. Do the same thing on the other side. All right? Now, uh, we're going to have to cut the uh, sprocket so that it will slide over the hub. It's very important that you get this hub, this hole, centered before you uh, go cutting on it. And the way, I, the way I actually did it was I laid the sprocket down on the table. I set the hub as close to center as I could, just eyeballing it. There's little holes around it that are evenly spaced that you can get kind of close on. But then I took a straight edge, 
I laid it up against the sprocket like this and I marked the teeth that it touched on the edge okay and I drew a straight line across okay once I had my straight line drawn or you know once I had my straight line I counted the number of teeth in between the two marks moved up about five or six teeth counted the same number of uh, teeth Drew another line, moved over a little bit more, counted the number of teeth, drew another line, and I worked my way all the way around the sprocket, marking those lines until I had a good tight crisscross pattern in here that now I can lay the hub down on and the lines are very close to it and a lot easier to get it almost money center. Now once you've got it, once you've got it to where you're satisfied that it's in the center of the sprocket, you want to hold down on the hub and take a, a metal scribe and scribe the sprocket all the way around the hub real tight that's going to be our cut line we're going to, when we cut the center out of our cut the center out of the sprocket all right um, what i did on on mine is i used a grinder a, gr a metal grinder cutter off of a dremel rotary tool i cut down below the lines you know pretty close but not above them once I had the, the meat of it taken out, I changed from a cutter blade, a cutter grinder on the Dremel to a wide grinder head. And then I just ground around until I got it right up to the edge of that line that I scribed. Then I placed it over to the hub. It was it still wouldn't go on. It was a little bit tight because I mean I, I did it very uh, conservatively. And that's and you want to. Uh, if your lines are even and your grinds are even, just take the same amount off every contact point all the way around the hub, just a little bit at a time, or, or around the sprocket, I mean, excuse me, I said hub, around the sprocket until it will just slide over the hub, okay? Now, before you uh, actually start trying to do your fine grind, I would suggest you go in and grind the paint off the hub because we're going to weld this sprocket onto here. And if you grind the paint off, it'll give you a better welding surface. Anyway, once you get the... Uh, sprocket where it will slide over the hub it is pretty well centered because these teeth are factory spaced it should be very close to money but another thing we have to worry about is where the crane goes through and gets mounted the sprocket has to be 90 degrees off this crank when it's mounted the nice thing about the factory is is they actually machine these 90 degrees flush so if you take the old barren race that you pulled out that you tapped out with the wooden dowel earlier you take it you set it back in place and with a wooden mallet or a wooden spacer and a hammer lay this uh, race back on there tap it down till it's seated and when it's seated it will touch all the way around the hub and of course that'll be this side you're working on but I want to show you the seat okay once the uh, bearing race is seated Grab the hub, grab the sprocket with your fingers, pull it back till it touches that race all the way around. You've made it tight to this hub, the race is a little wider than the hub, it should just lock almost right in place. Okay? With it touching all the way around, now take your wire welder. You want a low temperature weld here. You don't want to heat it up, hot, heat the sprocket up enough to warp it. So I would suggest either a low yield electric welder or best best thing to use is a wire feed and spot weld the contacts on the, from the sprocket onto the hub I only have about let's see I've got 10 spots on each side of these little arms going around through here I don't know if you can see them but anyway um, I've got about 10 spot welds on here and it's plenty plenty strong enough okay once that's done we set it off to the side and cool don't burn your hands on it all right and I wouldn't really suggest even dipping it because I don't know how hot you got that race. You cool it off too fast, you can cause your problems. Just let it cool, let it cool off at room temperature. We can come back to it. Okay, the next part we want to assemble then will be our drive arm. And the crank you're going to spin around that hub, the pedal where the pedal that's missing now is, we're going to mount this to that arm. That's why it's called the drive arm. It's going to drive our rotating gear. All right. I built this out of a 12 inch piece 
of half inch square tubing and uh, connected the end, on the end here, a piece of one inch black pipe. The uh, trick to doing this here is on one, one side of the uh, half inch pipe, you want to grind it so it contours to this one inch pipe. Just set it up there until you don't see any gaps. Now you have to make sure when you get this thing welded together that this here is square. I mean, you, know, you want this thing dead money as you can get it straight off of this bar. And you want it centered here before you weld it together. But once you have the contour of this curve, the half inch tube is ready to weld the, the carrier on. Now, the carrier, how wide do you want to cut it? That's the deal, because a one inch pipe, you, know, you get it several lengths. What I suggest is you take two of the bearing carrier, or bearing races, or the bearings actually, excuse me, off the old glider. You put them facing each other, the way they're gonna go into this assembly. And you measure the distance between the two flanges, okay? I didn't actually do that on this one. On this one, I just saw it, I just thought it would be perfect to do it to the half inch uh, square tubing. But the problem is I've left a gap in between these bearings and I can't squeeze them together because, they, uh, because they're already seated too far apart. So if you squeeze two of the bearings together and you measure the distance between the flanges, that's actually the width you want this piece cut. It has to be cut straight, it has to be cut true. If you don't have a chop saw or a really good band saw or drop saw, something that will cut this very square Take it down to your local lumber yard. If you're going to buy these materials at the yard anyway, most likely. Uh, they usually have a chop saw and they can cut them for you. You just tell them how wide you want it. They'll mark it, cut it, have them cut three or four in case you mess them up when you're trying to weld them back together, whatever. But the width needs to be the distance between the two flanges with the inside of the bearings touching. Okay? Once you have this cut to size, now you want to weld the two together. Where you have the contour, you want to face this up against it. Again, you want it evenly centered along the length of the bar. You want it centered going across the edge of the bar, and it has to be square. If you ground it correctly on your contour, it should saddle right in with no problems. But, you know, you're going to be trial and error if it's a little bit off on your, if your grind's a little bit off, eyeball it and make sure, get you a straight edge run it right down that pipe and make sure that it splits this thing dead center because that is very important. If it's not centered, if it's not centered, it's going to throw your chain off later. It'll tighten, be able to have it on one side and wobble on the other. And if you're not square, if you're not square with it, then it will actually throw the chain. All right, so you want it square and centered. Center, center. Very important. Center, center, square. All right. Now, the bearings will not fit inside the one inch pipe as is, okay? Uh, there's about a sixteenth of an inch shy of being able to fit. The grinder tool that you use to make this contour and to do your, the little rotary tool grinder head, take it, stick it inside, put this in a vise, after it's welded, squared and centered, stick it in a vise, run the grinder head around the inside circumference of this tube until this will just almost press all the way in by hand. You don't want it to be sloppy. You don't want to work it down so far that it'll just fall in and out. You want to be able to press it in, but you want to just be able to press the last maybe sixteenth of an inch. Because you don't want to press in so hard that you're going to distort this face. You don't want it pressed in so hard you can't get it out later in case your bearings go out. You want to be able to Press it in so it can't slip, but not so tight that you couldn't work it back out by tapping it or pulling on it, all right? Do that to both sides until they can just barely press in. Don't press them in other than with your hand, but when they can press in, then you know you've got it right. Okay, now remove one of them. You only want one side in to actually seat the bearing, all right? And what I did is I laid the, the arm down on the table Put the bearing in place as far as I could press it evenly all the way around with my hand. And then I took a 7 8 socket that just barely fit around this outside flange. It fits on it so that you're not banging in the middle, you're not banging on the bearings, except you're just banging on the flange. 
you lay the socket over top of it and you just tap it with a hammer until it seats. And just like with the bearing races, seating means it's actually touching all the way around. Okay? If this was cut with a chop saw and it's seated, it should be pretty well squared up with no problems. But we're going to make sure that, they're, that the two bearings are true to each other. So before we seat the second bearing, we're going to run the, dowel, the, the drive rod that we're going to use for the cassette carrier. It's just a six inch bolt in this case. You're going to run it in here, right? And you're going to run it, oh, run it past. You're going to run it through and above this side. There's no bearing here. There's not supposed to be a bearing here right now. All right, we're going to run it through the bearing that we've seated up here, and then we're going to run this bearing down onto this tube. And what that does is it gives us a, uh, it, it aligns the bearings for us, okay? Because if this straight rod, this machined straight rod can go through it, then that means they have to be pretty well true to each other, okay? Just like this, okay? You, to seat this one, you're just going to crank down on it a little bit, tap it with the socket. Now, if this is sticking up too far, you're going to have to back it back off. You know, you don't want it too high, just enough to make sure that these are true to each other. As you squeeze this down, you crank it, you tighten it up, you tap around it until it seats. If it can seat with that bar through it, then they're, they are aligned and they're true and that's what we're after. Okay? Next, we're going to have to put a slot in this... Uh, arm. Like I said, the arm itself is going to mount to the hole where the uh, pedal was that we no longer needed. But we're going to have a chain going from the cassette up to the fixed bearing and we need a way to move the chain around, change, you know, adjust, the, make adjustments to the chain. To do that, we're going to cut a slot in the bar. Okay? The way I did it is I measured down an inch and a half Making sure the slot, the slots are on the same side that the bearing, that the, that the rod goes through. You can put it on this side, you're pretty well done, have to start all over again. But anyway, anyway, to cut my slots out, what I did was I laid the, I put the uh, tube, in a, the square tube in a vise. I measured down an inch and a half and put a cross mark. I measured down three inches from that and made another cross mark. Now, in hindsight, I should have went down four inches. So I would suggest you make your second mark at four inches. And you drill in the dead center, three-eighths hole at both marks. Okay? Then you take a straight edge and you line it from the outside of the hole on one end to the outside of the hole on the other end. And you scribe a straight line. Do the same thing on the other side of the hole. You Run your scribe, you run your picture straight line on the top of the holes, and you run a straight, straight line. Then you can take the cutoff, you can take a cutoff blade for your rotary tool and just very carefully grind out that line. Flip it around, grind out the other line, do the same thing on the other side of the bar. Because you want an all the way through 3 8 slot to adjust your chain, just chain tension with. Okay? This bar is complete now. If we go back to our hub, that now should be more than cool because it's going to take you a while to build that arm. All right, first thing you want to do is the uh, one race we hadn't put in, you want to put it back in. Tap it around until it seats. So both races are in. The sprocket's good and true. We're happy with our build. We go ahead and reassemble it. Now, on the pedal side, where that bar was, you have a set of threads. On the other side, you have a set of threads. The threads over here are larger than the ones on the opposite side and they're right-handed thread, okay? Very important because this side's left-handed thread. You have two taper nuts. One's a hair bigger than the other. If you line them up flat side to flat side, you'll see that one's bigger than the other. It's the bigger one we want. It's got to go over the south side set of threads. Now, you want to mount it where the taper is facing in flat side out. So you put it over, you insert it, flat side up, go in. Now these are fine threads, very easy to cross thread. 
if it's giving you any resistance whatsoever, back out and try to realign the threads because this should go on. It's even an old rusty beat up one like this one should go on fairly simple. Which, speaking of old and rusty, it's kind of funny that since I got a second here to tighten that up, I'm not cleaned, greased, or anything on these, even the chain. All I did was work the chain loose, found some, found enough root places in it that I could bend it and uh, cut it to size. So I'm working with old, rusty, dirty bearings. I'm going to take them out, I'm going to clean it, I'm going to paint all this thing and make it pretty here later. I'm showing you how to build it with the raw, rusty, dirty, filthy stuff. Okay? <laughs> so, if I can build it with this, you can build it with just about any bike you find if you can make the pedal turn around this hub. Because the cassette itself, as long as the teeth aren't messed up, we're not going to use its ratchet assembly inside. We're going to strip this down all the way. I'll show you how to do that, or I'll show you what we're doing here in a minute. But, I mean, this is as raw as it gets. All right, anyway, I've got the uh, first tapered nut on the crank. Next, you want to slide on a set of ball bearings. There's a flat side and the ball bearing side. You want to take the flat side and put it up against the taper. Okay? Got that set. You want to insert the crank on the opposite side of the sprocket. Okay? It'll go in both ways, but you want to come in from the opposite side of the sprocket. Take it all the way down, turn it up, and let the bearings get seated in the race. Okay? You can kind of see how that's seated in there. All right, put the taper up against it. The taper is tapered just to keep everything centered. That's why your crank is very true and centered. Okay, next, the other set of bearings. Bearings in, flat side out. So start, bearings is going up. So that they, the bearings are actually what touch the race. The flat side will be the surface you see. Grab your other tapered nut. Now remember, this is a left-handed thread. You know, the old righty tighty lefty loosey don't work. You're going to loosey lefty, <laughs> or you're going to tighten lefty, excuse me. You're going to tighten lefty. So, take the bearing, taper first, goes in. Again, these are fine threads, so be very diligent about not cross threading them. Once you get it on true, it should spin very easily. Okay, now this nut, you do not want to over tighten. It is basically a finger tight operation. All right, now I've got old mechanics hands. My idea of tight and other people's may be a little bit different. So what you want to do is you want to tighten it down tight as you can. I mean, really get in there and grunt it. Feel and see if there's any slop in and out on the crank, All right? If there's not, you're probably good to go. But you can still take a ring, take your pliers, put on it, lefty to tighten it, remember? And just give it kind of a eighth or a quarter twist, you know, I wouldn't, uh, you don't want to over tighten because you'll bind the bearings. And you'll actually end up tearing the bearings apart by over pressing them. All right. But see, like I said, old, rusty, unclean bearings, and that's still a pretty smooth little rotation. All right. And you want to make sure it's, if it's, if it's tight when you rotate, that means you're over tightening this nut. Loosen it, back it off a little bit. Next will be your washer. That's got a little, it's got a little flange, a little tab inside of it. And the tab goes inside the little slot that's on the side of this crank. If you don't line those up, it won't go all the way down. And then you've got your locking nut. goes over top of that. Again, left threaded nut. And it's a very thin nut. So this is actually the easiest one in the world to cross thread. Make sure that you get it on there where it's true. And like I said, this spins pretty easy when it's right. If it's giving you resistance, back off and realign it. Okay? You snug this one all the way down with your fingers. Now this one you actually want to tighten, but it's the locking nut. It's what keeps over all those others from backing off. And just kind of give it a, a little crank, a little twist, whatever. And there you go. Alright. We have the sub assembly set up. She's cranking, she's working. Okay? Now at this point, I would suggest you figure out how you're going to mount this rig. Keep in mind. You've got your arm built. Your arm's going to come down like this. So you don't want, and you're going to have a sprocket sitting out here. You don't want something that's going to come up right here and then get wide or it won't work as a mount. It's going to have to be mounted on the edge like this or on a shaft. All right? Like I said, I use this handy little work lamp tripod. 
Um, I would invest, actually invest in one of these things if you're a full-time photographer because the lights are on are extremely bright and I shoot a lot of sports. What I'll do when I'm shooting the individual players and their pictures, I'll use the lamps that were on here. I separated the plug-ins on it and I use them for ground effect lights. It really lights up and throws, it gives me some cool shadowing. And you'll have the, the tripod you need. And like I said, this pipe fits pretty decent right down on top of it. And the reason I went ahead and put it on here, it's a lot easier to work with mounted than it is trying to freehand and put all this stuff together. All right. Now, let's take a look at our strop, our cassette. Keep trying to use the right terms here. All right. Now on the cassette, let me slide the jib out of the way for a minute. Okay, now on the cassette, we want to take all its guts out. If you look inside here, I have taken the ratcheting and everything. All I have is the raw cassette. Okay? We're going to use this six inch 3 8 bolt. We're going to run it through our arm and that's going to connect our chain and drive our light bars. Okay? So it needs to be 90 degrees, and it needs to be dead centered, okay? To do that was very simple. I actually, it was simple, I was surprised how simple it was. I went to the lumber yard, and I went to their bolt bin, and they had these big fender washers, heavy duty ones. You want some heavy ones. You don't want the thin, they make some thin ones, but you'll bend them. You want the heavy duty fender washers. This one's actually not a 3 8 I truly don't know what size it is because it didn't matter to me at the time. What matters is that when you push it down inside the cassette, it is very firm fitting inside this ring. You don't want to get one that's too big and have to grind it down unless you've got a lathe and you can turn it and make sure it's even. Find one that'll fit and then drill the hole out bigger. It's already got a center hole, so take a 3 8 drill, drill through it. You've got a good centered, well fitting washer. The one on the back side is actually a 3 8 fender washer. It fit perfectly down inside here. Okay. Take your 6 inch bolt. You run it once you get the washers in and they're both got the 3 8 hole. You run your washer, your bolt through. And then on this one I actually used a lock nut. It's quite a cranking to get this all the way down in there and you don't want this to come loose. So go ahead you know, grab you a, instead of using a regular hex nut, get you a nylon lined lock nut and just tighten it down. And I mean put a little bit of torque on this one. They said that's a three, that's a regular 3 8 uh, fender washer that's in there and I kind of bowed it in a little bit. I put some torque to it. You don't want to over torque it but I put a little bit of bite to that because I don't want it going anywhere. Once it's, once you've got this done and it's centered. <coughs> now this I said, I think I said earlier, this is a six inch bolt. And the reason it's six inches, you want it to go through the drive arm, plus give you plenty of threads out here to add lights and keep them away, you know, so they've got room to spin. You can even go longer. I wouldn't go any shorter. Any shorter would be very close on a lot of my light bars. And some of my light bars, or most of my light bars are pretty thin. But I do have a couple that are kind of thick, you know. I mean, it's probably, what, two and a half, almost three inches thick. And this sits here like this and has to spin with that with the drive arm up here. So give yourself a little bit of room. You don't want to make this so long that it bows, you know, but you know, eight inch you can get away with. I like the six inch, it's just a comfortable distance. Anyway, to install this into the arm, I actually already showed you earlier uh, when I was trying to show you how to set that other bearing. But you take your, it doesn't matter which side because it's uh, symmetrical. It doesn't matter what side, but you want to run it up into your uh, bearings. Before you do so, you want a way of locking the bearings. So take you a nut, a regular, a regular hex nut that you can spin with your fingers, but you're going to use this to lock up against the edge of that uh, bearing. Spin it all the way. I spin it all the way down to about an inch away from the sprocket. If not, you're going to have to spin it later and adjust it. Like I said, a lot of this is just for your light bar. All right. Once you get it down about an inch, start your Start your uh, threaded uh, bolt into the threaded bearing. Run it up until it taps the other one. Now you're going to have some aligning here. You're not aligning, you're going to have truing issues because the bearings can move. The, the threads won't be 
true to each other. So you'll have to toy around with it just a little bit to get them to line up, and once they get lined up, it'll, it'll go back to turning easily. Okay, there we go. All right. Now, one way to do this real fast if you don't have strong fingers, take your 9 sixteenths, place it along the side of the drive bar on the bearing, take the another 9 sixteenths, do the same thing on the other side, and squeeze all three together, and then you can just spin fire out of it. Okay, and it'll hold the bearing, it'll keep the bearings from offsetting on you. If you only hold one side or you don't hold either side, what happens is as you spin this, these get offset and they bind. So you want to keep them true to each other. Okay? We've got it ran down on there pretty good. We can use this here to lock it down, but we don't need to lock it down. We'll have to make an adjustment here in a minute, so you don't really need to lock the bearings. But you do want to go ahead and put the other bearings lock nut on. Run it down. Okay, you don't want to quite make a test because you adjust this in and out to align it with the chain when you when you get ready to size your chain or when you shift make gear changes. Okay. Now what I like to do is I go ahead and I put another nut on here. And what that's going to be is the backing nut for my bar light. I put a couple of washers, one to go on either side of my my light. And for the outside nut, I use a wing nut. That way I don't have to grab a wrench every time. Most of my uh, lights are very light. Just the torque I can put on it with a wing nut is tight enough to spin it. And they actually make some of these, uh, they make some of these wing nuts that's got little teeth on them that'll really grip in and take a bite. Okay, but now we have a complete uh, drive arm. All that's left to do is to make this connect to our jib. All right. Holding the sprocket down and in with the hub sprocket up and in. Made them together. And see how that pretty well lines my sprockets up? Let's see. Make sure it's turned enough. I can't tell from this distance. I'm about half lined. All right. But anyway, I'm pretty well lined between here. All right. Now, Take a three inch, three eighths bolt, threads on the sprocket side of the uh, drive arm. Run the bolt through the hole where the old uh, pedal was. And put your nut on it. Now, you want, to, uh, you want to set this where the nut, or where the uh, drive arm has about a half inch to an inch of play. I'd, I would make it a full inch of play down here before you snug it up too tight. And the reason for that is, is we're going to put the chain on here as tight as we can get it as is. And when you go to take it off later, you're going to need a little room to lift it up to take it back off. And we're going to line it up from the very beginning with the uh, largest sprocket on the cassette. Okay? So we'll take our 2916 one to hold on the outside of the bar, like so, and you kind of hold everything together that keeps them aligned, and just tighten that nut up, just a snug tightening, you don't over tighten it, you don't want to torque it down, plus you're going to take it back off here in a minute anyway. Now, take your chain, now my chain's already together, I don't want to re-break a chain, like I said this is kind of a rusty one, so it's a pain in the rump to do, but you drape your broken chain that you've already cut and left full length, you drape it across the stationary sprocket and let it dangle down. And what you want to do is you want to adjust. You want to adjust. Let me see. Can I see that sprocket? Let's see. My eyes aren't very good. Oh, yeah, we can see it. All right. You want to adjust this sprocket to where it is in line with this chain. Without the chain on it, it's actually simple. You take your 2 9 16s and your lock nuts are loose. You got you some room to work with. You don't do for it to move. Take the 2 9 16 put it on either side of the bearings, or on the uh, drive arm over the bearings, and you simply spin the sprocket until it lines up with the chain. Oops, I need to give myself enough room on my lock nut there, make it off some more. Alright, let's see here. Is that steel? 
There we go. Now see, I'm not quite touching the arm or the my uh, tripod, and it's pretty straight. It doesn't have to be exact. Uh, you know, you got on a, on ten speed when you're riding the bicycle, it's got an adjuster that can move around, so it don't have to be dead money. But the closer it is to straight, the smoother the operation's going to be. All right, the tighter you can make the chain, it'd be smooth operation. If you're too far off to one side or the other, the sprocket, the chain can jump, and you don't want to over tighten this, so you want that little bit, just a little bit of slack in there, or a little bit of lack of tension. You don't really want slack, just not tight. You don't want it banjoed. Because when you spin this, if it's too tight, it's hard to crank. You're binding everything, okay? So you want a, 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 a comfortable fitting chain. That's a good word for it, comfortable fitting. Once you have these in line, you simply take your chain and you wrap it around the sprocket back up to here and you should have plenty of extra if you kept the whole chain which you should have uh, you should have plenty of extra you just make sure that the you have a male going into a female and you reconnect your chain using this as your distance okay what that gives you basically is this all right, now, I have that secured where I measured so I can get my chain on. I have to loosen the bar. Like I said, I take a 9 16 put it up against the drive arm, loosen the nut. That gives me my torque to be able to twist it down. You'll use that same uh, technique whenever you're adjusting your chain, you know, when you're changing sprockets and need to retighten. All right, now, so I can pull this up, and because I left that slack in there, I'll have enough room to get this chain around and on. Now, take my wrench, put it out here to the outside, grab it so I've got some leverage. Go ahead and pull it, pull it down on the drive arm to where this is, like I said, comfortable. Not tight, not sloppy loose, comfortable. That's going to be our adjustment term, comfortable. <laughs> And we want to torque this down pretty good. Now I would suggest uh, this bolt actually is only two inch and I need a three inch. I told you a three inch earlier and that's really what you need. It, it will serve two purposes. One, it give me room to put a washer back here because as you're tightening down on this, you have a tendency to distort this uh, drive arm to get it tight enough that it can't slip. You have to torque it down pretty good. So get you a, big, a washer with a three inch bolt and it'll stick out in here. And because the drive arm is stationary, it will stay in between the chain. It's not gonna hit nothing unless you come all the way back here. So about three inches, you know, but you could get away with three and a half, but I'd go three inches. What else that does is it gives you a place right out here you can put a tab and put a stationary light. So that as you're spinning, this light just spins around the orbit, it don't turn like the uh, the light bar's going to, or like our end light's going to. Come out our light. Make sure we put uh, we put a lock uh, a wing nut on the outside of this six inch shaft. So we just take that loose, get one of our washers off. The hole we mounted our our we cut a hole in the uh, end of our light bar. That's three eighths. We'll sleeve right on top of it. And we'll put that over into that shaft. Put the nut back or the washer back on and the wing nut. Now. I just noticed, some, noticed something I failed to do. And I did it because I was talking. It, it's actually become a, a second nature to do, but I didn't do it. And that was, once I got the sprocket aligned, I did not set my lock nuts, okay? That's not good because you get to cranking this, one other bearings may have a little bit more drag in the thread than the others and they will bind. That's why you want to lock them down. And to lock them down, you simply, do not change the uh, bearing position on this the way it's threaded because you'll bind. You want to hold the bearing still and tighten the lock nut. Okay, I don't know if y'all can see that, but just like that. Here and there. Okay, and I do believe that will do it. Okay. I actually just approached the camera. I want to make sure y'all can see that. All right. Now, let me move my little table I've got set up here. I take my 
hand, I put it on the top. Let's turn the light on just for fun. Take my hand, put it up here, and this looks like where we come into this video at, don't it? Because it is. The only difference is it's on a different sprocket. Now it's only has it only has three points and two cranks. See? One crank, two cranks, three points. Very versatile little machine. Hope y'all have fun. Um, if you'll if you're watching this video, hopefully you saw it from lightpaintingphotography.com. Jason Page was nice enough to do an interview and help us promote this little machine. Uh, there is a PDF file with all the instructions, pretty much the way I told them to you here, written out. Uh, good luck. Have fun. Happy light painting.